Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I want to show you how to solo Dire Wild, a cooperative deck building dungeon crawler from Iron Horde Games. The premise of Dire Wild is that we are all shamans from different tribes who are able to summon animals and have them help us in our tasks. And one of our members, Karn, has become corrupted and he is currently in the woods destroying everything around him and preparing to ruin um, our magic as we know it. So our goal across three rounds is to defeat some of Karn's minions and eventually get strong enough to defeat Karn himself in the final act of the game. For a solo game of Dire Wild, you're going to actually have to play two-handed. So in this case, I've chosen two characters that we are going to try to play as this game. We're going to be Tog from Clan Groundbreaker. He's a berserker who basically um, gains attack power when he takes wounds. He can also um, destroy wounds by taking a poison, which basically means that his stamina over here is going to go down, which you'll see in play. He also has some specific spells that are going to allow him to help himself and others in battle. Romy is from Clan Shadowleaf. Her skill is that she's venomous, so before she battles an enemy, she can do some poison damage to it. Um, she allows heroes to switch locations, if you pay magic for that, and she can also deal additional poison before other heroes battle an enemy. So basically, she has some kind of roguelike poisoning skills, He's a straight up berserker. So in the initial setup of the game, when you unwrap everything, um, you are actually encouraged to create these hero boxes that contain everything that you need for your hero. So you'll notice that this is double-sided. Um, these cards are also double-sided, so you can choose what variation of hero from a specific clan that you want to play. But we're gonna go with Tog and Romy for this game. So in order to set Romy up, you literally just dump out the contents of her hero box, which is really useful. So we have a starting deck for her, which is going to have two kiln salamanders, which are her special clan cards. And you're going to have five kittens and three puppies. And that's what a starting deck in this game looks like. So we'll shuffle up in a moment. That's going to be her deck. She's also going to have some magic. So most of her magic is going to start out um, not in play, but each player begins with two magic. She's going to have one counter cube that's going to go here at zero on her stamina tracker. And then we're going to pick, we're going to leave this standee behind. Sorry, Vail. And Romy is going to get a standee. And that is how quick hero setup is in a game of Dire Wild, which is something that I actually really appreciate. And I wanted to show you just how streamlined it is once you've done initial setup. Um, we also have Tog's box and we're going to do the same thing. So we take out all the contents. So in his case, he gets Rock Stoats as his special clan creature, but he has about the same starter deck, five kittens, three puppies, and two specials. Um, he will have matching gems for his clan color, which is black. So we'll put his counter here. He gets two active magic, the rest stay off to the side, and then he gets standy. And voila, our heroes are ready for action. Now we're going to talk about board setup. So Dire Wild has this kind of weirdly long board. So we're going to be sliding it back and forth to show you guys some of what's going on during the game. Um, but the first thing we're going to set up is our market and all of our creatures. So the first deck we're going to set up here is the common creatures that have a green, kind of grayish green background. So our common creatures are just going to go right here. Next, we're going to have our advanced creatures, but you can't access those right away, which I'm going to show you. So while common creatures have this kind of greenish background, the advanced creatures have a blue background. So we're going to shuffle these up and set up their deck. So once you put the advanced creatures down, you don't just leave it like that. What you have to do is you have to actually lock the deck. So you can't access your advanced creatures right away. You need to put locks enough locks for two times the number of players, so in this case four locks for two players, and you'll need to be spending charm, the currency in the game, to work on breaking those locks before advanced creatures can enter play. There are also several other locked spaces that help you power up as the game goes by. Um, so here we have channeling. If you did not battle, return a creature you played this turn to the top of your deck. So if you drew a good creature but didn't have a chance to use it, you can bring it back into your deck. This one allows you to re-roll any one results by taking a wound. 
So you can have heightened reflexes, then channeling. And then once you are a veteran, you can use a D6 instead of a D3 in battle. So initially we're only gonna be able to roll a D3 when we are fighting with minions. Um, but once we hit this stage, we can use a D6 instead, which gives us a better chance of hitting and also a better chance of getting a critical hit in a battle. So now we're gonna just populate the market. So depending on how many players there are, uh, there are, you put more or fewer creatures out on, in the wilds, which is basically the market row. Um, in this case, because we're playing a two player game, we're gonna fill the whole thing up. But three would only have five, a four player game would only have four. So let's do one, two, three, four, Ooh, the Cherry Red Panda. How perfect for Beyond Solitaire. Five, and then six. So these are our options for our first round for purchase. So now we're gonna set up the rest of the board. So we're now gonna handle some enemy related stuff. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up this little space for our good friend Karn. So we're gonna take his standee and we're gonna put it at the far end of the Karn hunting track. And then we're gonna set up his deck. So what that's gonna mean, Karn is gonna work differently from other enemies. But the first thing that you should know is you should put two regenerate cards, one for each player at the bottom. And then there are 15 Karn cards Making sure. So there are 15 Karn cards that have like AI information on the back, but what you do is you shuffle them and you just put them on top of this regeneration deck. So basically Karn has three lives in this game. He gets to come, we kill him once, he'll come back, kill him twice, he'll come back. The third time we kill him, he's done. We are also gonna give him a tracking token because he has stamina just like we do. So we'll put this here. We're also going to set up the AI deck down here. So there are actually two AI decks of the game. There's the green one, which is like the normal easier one, and then there's the red hardcore. You can either pick one or the other, or you can actually shuffle them up and play them together. It's up to you. We're gonna start with green, just kind of show those off. But there is a hardcore difficulty if you want to up the ante. So here's where we'll put the AI cards. Now we're gonna put the treasures out. As you're gonna see, these treasures are super useful when we can get them in the game. So that is actually probably the most exciting deck in the game in terms of cool stuff happening to your characters. We're gonna put out the correct land card. So this is Karn's dungeon, but you can actually switch out the land in the middle based on what stages you're playing. So there's chapter one, chapter two, and then chapter three. So we are setting out chapter one, the Red Mill Fields right now. So we're just gonna place that tile right over the board. And now we have the correct um, area to begin battling from. Now that the treasures are out and the board is out, we can also put little treasure tokens on the board to show us where we need to move if we wanna be drawing some special treasures from that treasure deck. So now we're gonna set out some minions. And let me tell you, once you get to the higher levels of minions, these are not easy at all. So there's an upcoming minions area. So we're gonna start from bottom to top. So we're gonna go with an acolyte minion, two acolyte minions, one level four minion. I shuffled this deck and just pulled the one off the top. Same thing for here, there's gonna be one level three. There'll be one level two minion, and then one level one minion. And that's the minion deck for a two player game. You can have more minions with higher player counts. What this is gonna mean for us right now, these minions, is that we're gonna face two of them because these are the two player markers. You get more minions for three and four in chapter one. So we're gonna put the level one minion out. We're gonna put the level two minion out. We don't know what they are until they see us or we decide to attack them. We'll also give them some stamina just like everybody else. That's gonna play a key role when we start to battle later in this round. We're also gonna put out our minion standees. So this guy's gonna hang out here on the red. This blue guy is gonna come here to the blue starting spot. It's almost time to play. The last thing we have to do is set up the wound deck and get to the staging area. So most of the wounds are gonna go here. Um, wounds basically just clog up your hand and annoy you. Um, and as because I'm playing Tog the Berserker, sometimes wounds will be helpful in some ways to me, as long as I can get rid of them later. 
However, we also have a wound timer. You put six fatal wounds here into the fatal wounds pile. And this pile will diminish either when you disengage from an enemy, which causes a fatal wound to be taken. So you move one card from here to here, or you can take fatal wounds when um, Karn is on the board. So he's gonna move up his track. If he's on the board and we haven't dealt with his minions, every turn that he's still around, he's gonna just siphon off of this fatal wound deck. And if we run out of fatal wounds and we end a round with the stack empty, then we lose the game. So we have to move fast because six fatal wounds can go by pretty quick. So now we're just about ready to rock. I'm gonna put my little hero boards under here. So you can at least see some of it. We'll move them up and down as necessary. We also have a really nice turn order card that's gonna be super helpful as I walk you through the turns of this game. So let's begin chapter one. All right, so let's roll. It's time for chapter one. We are gonna put Romy and Tog into the staging area until they actually move. And actually, you know what? To make this easier for y'all to see, it'll be a little awkward, but let's just keep these standees flat so you can actually see everybody. So this guy will be here, this one will be here. I think that's better for visibility. This is the retail version of the game. The Kickstarter edition had um, minis in it, I believe. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do step one, which is move counters. So moving counters would matter more if we had already um, had some attacks and extra movements, things that affect stamina this round. But basically what you should know is that everybody is tending towards the zeros in the middle of their tracks. So if I were at a negative two stamina for some reason, I would move up one counter towards zero. If I were up here to plus one, I'd move down towards zero. But the idea is that everybody's moving back towards balance, back towards zero, and their counter will move one in that direction at the beginning of each turn. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to reveal our first AI card and talk through what it means. So let's see what we get. Okay, not too bad. Karn is going to move one space up his hunting track. So he's going to move up one. Let's just make him visible as well. So he's moved one up the hunting track. That is not great, but we'll deal with it. Let's move all this down so he doesn't interfere with the minion. So he's gone one up his hunting track. Eventually he's gonna reach his altar. Then he's gonna pop up on the board and start messing with us. And he'll do that every round up until the final round. So I think it is possible to defeat Karn before the round three, but I've never experienced that. He basically is just a huge pain in the butt the first couple of chapters while you're dealing with these huge nightmares that he's thrown before you in the form of his minions. The other thing that this AI card is going to mean is that if there's an eyeball here, that would mean that the most recent, like the, the simplest minion will that is idle is going to flip over and see us and start trying to attack. Um, however, nobody noticed us. We are still just hanging out. So they're just going to move an automatic three. Each of the minions is, and I'll show you how that works. And then if Karn were on the board, then that would, um, that would uh, mean that we were going to move a fatal wound down to the wound pile and advance our timer. So first our minions are going to move. And the way that they're going to move actually is if you look at this board, there's little feet tracks that show you the direction they're going to go when they're just doing things automatically. So this guy started here. He's going to go one, two, three. FYI, there's only orthogonal, not diagonal movement in this game. This dude started here. So he's gonna go one, two, three. So that's our enemy movement for this turn. As you can see, there are little walls and like the edges of the board. This helps, um, it helps you keep track of that stuff if you, for example, have a power that allows pushback. Because if you push one of these guys into something, it actually lowers their stamina and makes it easier to attack them on future turns. So now it's gonna be on us. We're gonna choose our turn order first, then we will draw our first hands of cards. Um, I don't really know what to expect, so let's just say that Romy's first and that Tog is second, and we can change that turn to turn depending on what we want tactically in a given round. So now the first thing that we're gonna do is draw five cards for each of us. So Romy's gonna draw five cards, and she's going to get one, two, oh, I got both of my salamanders. So I got three kittens and two kiln salamanders. 
Oh man, these couldn't have come up at a worse time in a lot of ways. They are my most powerful guys and they distract minions. So hopefully we will be able to get those back soon because I really need them to fight. Bummer. But the good thing about them is they also have charm. So I'm gonna have five charm to spend this round, which is gonna help me buy a lot of cool stuff on the market. And that's basically gonna be all that I can do. We'll go through all the different steps just to show you how everything works. I'm not planning to battle this turn. So that's Romy's hand. Let's draw five cards for Tog and see what he's up to. All right, so Tog has also drawn three, ooh, three kittens, one puppy, and one rock stoat. So I may wound myself. I'm not planning to battle this turn, however, so I'm probably not gonna do that because it'll just go back to zero anyway and I'll have a wound. All right, so I have three basics and um, one special. I'm gonna have four charm to use, one of these diamonds, on the market. So basically what's gonna happen is that Romy's gonna get to, um, to purchase first and then I'll get to it second. So technically what you do before that, however, is so players draw, then you play all drawn cards. So if you have cards that have abilities, you play them down in the order of your choosing. So in this case, I'm not, not really gonna do anything with them yet. So what Romy will do is she'll just play a kitten, play a kitten, play a kitten. Sadly, play a kiln salamander. I may distract a minion, but none of our minions are active right now. They're both idle, so that's not gonna work. And then again, it may distract a minion, but once again, doesn't really work. So that is too bad, but I'm gonna have some charm to use in the next turn. Um, Tong is similar, he's just going to play out his cards. Kitten, 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 puppy. We're gonna play the rock stoat. I may wound myself, but I'm not gonna choose to do that this time because I really, basically when I wound myself, Tog's special ability is that when I take a non-fatal wound, so I take this into my deck, um, I will gain one rage. And when you gain rage, what that means is that you go up on the stamina tracker. And the further up you go, the more powerful your attacks are. However, at the end of the round, you're gonna always move at least one back down towards zero. So if I chose to wound myself now and move up, by the time I was gonna battle next round, I'd be ready to move down again. So it doesn't make sense to do that action right now. So we're just gonna have these spent out. Now I'm gonna to get to spend some charm, and that's an exciting thing to be able to do. So let's so let's look at the market and see what we can buy. Oh, and before purchasing, I should also say, I should reveal this card. You always get to see the top card of the um, of the wilds, like what's gonna be coming up on the market. Another pinback dragonfly, which is like not that exciting. All right, so let's have a look at what I might like to buy. Romy has five charm to work with. So one, two, three, four, five. So let's make the most of what we've got here. Hmm. So one thing I'm thinking about is that this minion is definitely gonna move um, and I wanna get this treasure. So what that means is that he's gonna move adjacent to me, whoever's here and see them. So what I was thinking is that it might be kind of cool to have Romy able to move away from that minion so why don't we spend one charm to pick up this Fenton Ostrich. I'm gonna spend a second charm to put it on top of my draw deck, which is a very cool function in this game. So basically if you have enough, if you have extra charm but not enough to buy like a full creature, there's a lot of different stuff that you can do. So this guy's gonna move down into here. This gets revealed. And then, okay, so a pebble crow, that's sort of adorable. And then I have three charm left, and I think I wanna use them to grab this Eldvar Chameleon. Because he allows me to replace this card with a zero to five charm card in any player's discard, and he has a nice base attack level. So I feel like he's gonna be a pretty useful dude down the line. So he's just gonna go on the top of my discard pile. So these are all gonna be discarded anyway in a moment, but this is my discard pile for now. So we'll just put him down here on the top of my discard. We'll move the Pebble Crow down and see what's next on top, which will be a Spitter Lizard. So one of the things I particularly like about Dire Wild as a deck builder is that 
there's lots of things to do with your leftover charm. So sometimes in deck builders, you know, you spend an odd amount and you have leftover change that you can't spend. That's not actually the case in this game, which I love. So if I wanted to spend extra charm to get this creature from the wild, I could. I can spend a charm to destroy anybody on the row, which is also good because, I mean, I've got a lot of pinback dragonflies. Probably I don't want them all. Eventually I'll want to blow them out of the market. You can spend extra charm, so you have to do it in order. You have to get rid of these locks before these, before these, before these, but you can be always working on power-ups with your extra charm, which I think is great. Basically, there's always something to do, something to do with your um, with your charm, even if, there's, even if you can't afford the creature you want, even if you have kind of a weird amount, there's always something to do. So I have four charm to spend. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and spend three of it to pick up this Pebble Crow. So he's going to go in my discard. We'll just move him over in a second. We'll put the Spitter Lizard down here. And then I have one charm left over. So I'm going to use it to pull one of the locks off of the Advanced Creatures deck so we can make progress towards getting at those Advanced Creatures. And that was our Charm Creatures round. So now we're going to build creatures now that we've done our market turn and I'm going to show you how that works. All right, so now we're going to build creatures and the way that that's going to work is, I mean, we're not going to battle this turn, but that's okay. It's worth it to know how to do this. So basically the way that you build creatures is that you choose one creature to be your base. So let's say that I want this kiln salamander to be my base creature for, um, for Romy. Then these other creatures are all going to flip and become a part of the creature with their skills. So this kitten doesn't really add much, except that it's feisty. I mean, that's cute. Fluffy. Feral. And because this guy flips to have a different skill, he will be slippery. So basically, this creature has a base attack value of two, plus one because of this one little attack sign up here, plus an extra movement. So my base movement is going to be three. It says so right here on this uh, adventure card. Um, and then I will actually have an extra movement available because I'm a slippery, feral, fluffy, feisty kiln salamid. So as you get better cards, you get more interesting modifiers and more interesting base cards that work off of each other in more satisfying ways than they do for the first few turns. But that is how you make a creature. We built one creature. And then let's go ahead and build a creature for Tog. So Tog has a kitten, 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 nothing too great, rock stoat, hyper puppy. So we're gonna take the rock stoat, we are gonna give him this basic puppy modifier to bring his attack value from two to three. And then these kittens just kind of don't do anything. You can actually just leave them off, and I will in future turns, but it's fun. Because he's a fluffy, feisty, live, hyper rock stoat. So that would be this creature. So we're not very powerful right now, but that's okay. We don't have to be. We build our creatures, and then we are going to move, battle, and discard. I am not planning to move right now. So my goal is, I mean, I'm planning to battle right now. I am planning to move. So we're not gonna fight either of these minions this turn. What we are gonna do is we're gonna run up and grab these treasures because I think that that's a good idea. So I'm going to get spotted by this red minion next turn. So I'm going to bring her up because remember we got that ostrich. I'm going to be able to disengage if I need to. We're going to grab this treasure, take this off the board, and we're going to take our first treasure card. So let's see what it is. Artifact Time Relic. Hmm. In the summon phase, destroy this card to discard a hero's entire unplayed hand and draw a new one. So basically, if I get a really garbage hand later in the game, I can dump this treasure in order to draw an entirely new hand, which could come in handy later. Now, Tog is going to move up from the staging area. So this is one, two, three. So I'm in the staging area as well. I'm going to do one, two, three. And then I'm going to spend one stamina to do four movement. So the way that's going to end up working is see how it'll tell you on here, base move, one extra move, um, you lose one stamina per extra move. So what we're gonna do is his base move of one, two, three, and then four to grab this treasure. We're gonna move a stamina down 
one in order to account for that. But it's just going to bump back up to zero at the beginning of the next round, so we may as well spend it. So let's see what treasure Tog has managed to get. He's got an artifact host relic in the summon phase. Destroy this card to pick a non-basic card in your hand. Look in your deck and discard for any duplicates of that card and put them into your hand. Reshuffle your deck. Interesting. So basically, if I get several cards of the same type that are, um, maybe I do want to buy all those pin, flat, pin back dragonflies, right? So uh, I can actually summon duplicates from my hand I mean, from my deck and my discard. So as long as it's not a puppy or a kitten, I can summon like the whole gang and bring them into play. Cool. So now that that's done, we're gonna discard. So all these guys go on the discard pile. All these guys go in the discard pile, but we're not gonna draw our next hand until we've already decided our player order and gone through the steps for this upcoming turn. So let's walk through one more turn and then I'll leave you guys to enjoy this game on your own. All right, so we are beginning another turn. We're gonna move counters. So remember how Tog spent an extra stamina to move an extra move? He's gonna go back up to zero because that is what moving counters means. Now we're gonna reveal a new AI card and see what our enemies are up to. Yikes. Okay, so these are taken off by the way. What's going on now is that Karn is moving another step towards his altar because that's what Karn does. We've been spotted. So what that means is that this red minion is going to see us. Um, we, let's actually move the board down so you can have a good look at that spot. So what that's essentially going to mean is that this level one minion is gonna flip because it saw us, we made some noise. Oh, it's an inkling. These are too cute to be bad guys. I really have a hard time with that. So he has three life, which means we have to wound him three times. He has seven attack, which is gonna come into play when we choose to battle him. And he can damage flying heroes. None of our guys have flying right now, although we may have cards that provide it later. And if he hits us, we take two poison. What that basically means is our stamina is gonna go down by two. It's not like a persistent effect like in other games. All right, so now we have an inkling to battle. Um, so Akavid took care of this, moved Karn. Got spotted, took care of that. Now he's gonna move f spaces towards the priority. So since our first player last round was Romy, our enemy's gonna move here, which is not unexpected anyway. And then this guy has not spotted us yet. So he is just going to move four, but He'll keep going this way. One, two, three, four. So this priority marker, this priority marker on the AI cards only applies to enemies that have been activated. So the first enemy got activated and then moved towards Romy. He didn't have to move a full four because he was right next to her anyway. This guy did not get activated. Therefore, he does not move towards Romy. He just keeps moving along the standard minion footpath until he is alerted to our presence. And then if Karn were on the board, we would need to handle this fatal wound movement. But fortunately, that is not happening yet. Although soon, soon. Interestingly, this minion is not going to attack right now. Um, actually, I have a chance to try to fight him before I do anything else. So let's think about how we want to approach this. Um, I definitely like to go after him. I don't know how much power we really have. We can give it a shot. So let's figure out who should go first and then see what's gonna happen. All right, so now it's time for us to do our thing and we're gonna choose our turn order again. I'm gonna go ahead and let Romy be first again and I'll put Tog as second. Um, and then let's see what happens. So let's just move up a little bit so you can kind of see what everybody's up to. So Romy's first, Tog's second. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we are going to um, draw our cards. So let's see what we get. So one, two, three, four, five cards for Romy. I had put that Fenton Ostrich on top of my deck last time, so that is good. So we have the Fence and Ostrich, we have two puppies, and two kittens. Interesting. 
Ooh, I'm utterly charmless this round. Okay, so what we're gonna do is first we're gonna play our cards. So I'm gonna go ahead, so these don't have any special abilities, but I'm gonna play this Fenton Ostrich. So it says draw a card, move one space, and ignore any disengagement penalty, which I absolutely want to do. So I'm gonna draw this card, so I drew another puppy. And then I'm gonna move one space away, ignoring any um, disengagement penalty. So that's good for me, because it means that I can move away from this inkling a little bit and um, and have some more options. Actually, instead of, yeah, I'm gonna go this way. That makes sense. So I've escaped from this guy without having to pay a disengagement penalty, which means moving a fatal wound down here. So if you are stuck with an enemy and you need to back up, it hurts you to back up and it makes the round in faster, which is not a great thing. So I forgot to show you, but our buddy Tog did also draw and he's gonna play his cards now. So these guys don't have any abilities. Tog is going to try to attack this turn, however. So what we're going to do is we are going to use this Rock Stoat. So it says you may wound yourself when you play it. So what we're going to do is we are going to take a wound. So fortunately, we're not talking fatal wounds here, just wounds. So this wound card is now going to go into my discard and it's going to annoy me later. But my stamina is going to go up plus one, which means that my attack value is also going to be plus one which is something that I really want. All right, so now we have done the player's draw. We've played all of our drawn cards. Now we're going to spend charm. And since Romy is the first player, she is going to get to spend her charm first. All right, so let's have a look at this market row and think about what we want. Um, I have only two charm to spend for Romy. Nothing, 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 nothing. One, two. So I do have two charm. Let's see what we can do with those. I'm interested in several of the stuff, several of the cards here, actually. Um, I am definitely interested in the Spitter Lizard. I like that it offers ranged attack. And she's already got the Eldvar Chameleon, so we could do some reptile stuff. There's also this Gear Bug, but I think that we might have Tog purchase that one. So yeah, we are going to spend our two charm on the Spitter Lizard, who he's going to go in our discard pile over here. And then we're going to bring down the Iron Crown Raptor and reveal, aw, a Fog Mount Parrot. Now it is Tog's turn to make a purchase. So let's see what we want to buy. All right, so Tog's hanging out over here with a Rock Stoat, which is worth one. Two, nothing, nothing, three. So we have three charm to spend as Tog. So I think what we should do is we should pick up this gear bug because I like it. It um, has a special ability that lets another player discard a card from their hand or in play. They may then draw a card and immediately play it. So it can give um, Romy a little bit of extra card reach on future turns. So we're going to grab this gear bug and put it in our discard. We're going to move the fog mount parrot down and I have one charm left over to spend. Oh, a bear. Um, so we are going to get rid of another lock on the advanced creatures. We are halfway to being able to use those and we should probably hurry that up a little bit. So that is our um, charm phase done. And now we're going to build creatures. All right. So let's see what the best thing at Romy can build is. She's not going to fight this turn, but you know, okay. So I guess what we would have is we would go with a puppy for that base attack. We could add one more attack for two, three. The kittens don't do anything, so I'm just gonna leave them out. And then plus an extra move fleet. So now we have a fleet wild loyal puppy. Um, so this puppy is fleet, and that means that we have some extra movement. I think that I might be sending Romy up to grab for uh, maybe some treasure. Actually, when I moved away from him, I probably should have moved up here, but we're just going to eat my mistake and lose it. But she should go up there and try to grab some cool stuff while there is time. On the other hand, we also have this... Uh, 
this potential creature for Tog. So we're definitely gonna use a Rock Stoat as the base for his base attack. We're just gonna move the kittens out because they kind of clog things up when you're building. And then we have a free Royal Rock Stoat. A free Royal Rock, a free Royal Rock Stoat. And we also know that um, Tog's stamina is up one. So our total attack right now is a five. Uh, versus the Inklings 7. So once again, we're actually not going to be able to do anything, and I wounded myself for nothing. I was kind of hoping that I could do something about it. Well, I think we can get close enough, actually, because we can bring him down one and then roll a die, and that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to go for it. So we've built our creatures, and what that means is now it's time to move, battle, and then discard. So moving, Romy will move first. She has a base move of three plus an extra move of one because she has a fleet puppy. So this fleet little puppy is going to have a go at this treasure. So we're going to do one, two, three, four. And then I'm going to be wasteful and do five, six and kill her stamina a little bit in order to grab another treasure. In this case, we got a channel relic. Destroy this card to use the magic ability of another hero one time for free. That's actually pretty cool. It's very cool indeed. So we are gonna have some good chances to use this later in the round or in a future round. So we'll take that. And that's what Romy was up to this turn. Now Tog is gonna come around. So what Tog is gonna do is he's gonna come and attack this minion. One, two, three. And this is not the easiest thing for him, but we're gonna see how we can do, because I wanna show you guys how battle works and I don't want this playthrough to drag on too long. So we're gonna show you this battle. Um, and win or lose, you will learn how it works. So what's gonna happen is that we are gonna pit our attack value against his attack value. And the thing is that it needs to be we need to basically get to the point where our attack is higher, not equal to the Inkling's attack. So as you might have noticed, this Inkling has a base attack of seven. So we need, with a combination of our abilities and die rolls, to beat seven. It's a bit of a tall order, but we are going to go for it anyway, just to kind of see what happens. So one of the things that we can do to help is we are about to battle, and Romy actually has an ability that can help us. She has a magical ability called Ikur. Before a hero battles an enemy, deal one poison damage to that enemy. So we're going to go ahead and spend her magic to cast this spell. Partially because it's also good for you guys to see how spells work. So it's before a hero battles an enemy, so we're spending those, ma those magic. And it's going to bring the stamina of this, of this inkling down to negative one. And what that means is that his attack value is now six. So we're going after an enemy with an attack value of six. Our attack value, our base value is one, two, three, four, plus an additional because we decided to take a wound using our rock stout at the beginning of the turn. So now we're up to five attack. So it's five versus six. What that means is that I need to roll a two or better on a D3 in order to win this battle. So let's see what we roll. Can we hit seven? We absolutely can. Five, six, seven is bigger than the six on the inkling. So the inkling is gonna take damage. The way that'll work is that we're gonna put one of our, one magic in Tog's color, which is black, on that card. And then once the inkling has three damage on his card, he is defeated and we will defeat him completely. He leaves the game. So now we're gonna discard our creatures and that'll be the end of this round as well. So, that is a game, well, that is a taste of how Dire Wild works. It's a really fun little deck builder. Um, I really like some of the touches that it has. I enjoy the tactical play. Um, I enjoy the way that the cards work together, and I actually enjoy stacking cards to build animals. And I like that the market has a number of ways to use charm in order to, um, in order to, uh, to remove locks, to burn creatures in the market, to do some extra stuff with the creatures rather than have leftover money essentially every turn that you're not spending. So this game has a lot of neat little touches. If you're looking for an interesting deck builder, this might be worth a um, worth further research from you.
So this was Dire Wild from Iron Horde Games, and happy gaming.